So, um, good morning, everyone. It's really great to, to see you all here. Um, and I would just, oh, yes, I've got um, the, the very um, happy job of uh, introducing our keynote speaker, our opening speaker. Um, I was just thinking about this in the run-up to, the, to uh, the conference, that a year ago, those of us, I don't know, Mark, how many of it was, how many people were here last year who were here today? Well, I, I've got, I couldn't see the slides. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, the, the, the 60 to 70 people who, who were in this room last year who are here today um, were, were also um, very privileged to hear Alison Muddett from PLOS talking about the need to, to change research culture. Um, and looking at all the different um, aspects of the stakeholders and, and interactions and, and understandings, policies that that was going to involve. And this year, um, we've got Mark Schultz, from, who's the President of Science Europe, as well as the, the head of the, the Luxembourg National Funder, to speak about Plan S. So I think what we've, what we've shown is that Researcher to Reader was very much on point last year, thinking about what needed to be changed, what needs to be kind of understood and, and unpacked and discussed. This year, we've got a really great opportunity to, um, to hear from the horse's mouth you know, what, what is happening, you know, what about the feedback, we've got an opportunity to you know, have a really wide-ranging discussion. Um, um, in the run-up to, um, to this meeting, Mark and I had a, a, a chat on the, the phone, and we agreed that um, we would leave plenty of time for discussion um, in this session. So, um, so do be thinking about what you, you know, want to hear, want to understand, see if we can unpack a really wide-ranging and, and useful debate. Um, and without more ado, Mark Schultz. Well, as, as the slideshow comes up, well, first of all, thanks to the, uh, to the organizer, to Mark, for the invitation to speak here at the conference. Many thanks to Fiona for the nice introduction. I'll say a few words about Science Europe be before starting, uh, or maybe I have to press here, or, no, one more. Yes, very good. Okay, so Science Europe is the, uh, very good, uh, here. So Science Europe is the uh, European Association of uh, major national research funders and, uh, and large performing organizations. We. Uh, represent funders and performing organizations from 27 European countries. And the, uh, the goal of the association is, uh, is threefold. It's first of all to, uh, to do advocacy, especially uh, in a strong and close interaction with the uh, European Commission. Uh, as you know, uh, when, when the framework programs are being shaped, these are essential times that we bring in the voice of and the experience that we gain as national research organizations and we do that in a very active way. The second uh, pillar of our activities is sharing best practices. Many of the founders have their own experiences, share or face similar problems, like open access is a topic that has been individually discussed in many of the, uh, of the, of the member organizations of Science Europe and where we feel that we can gain from learning from each other's experiences and sharing, uh, sharing good, good practices. And then the third pillar of our uh, of Science Europe actions is joint activities. And Plan S is clearly such a, such a joint activity where we feel that by aligning our policies and our actions, we can have a significantly larger impact than uh, than by each organisation doing it uh, doing it in their own way. So that's the goal of Science Europe. It is, we are not a funder, we are an association of funding organizations, but we do not run funding uh, programs on our own. Uh, it is much more a, a, a kind of forum where we share experiences and, and, and engage into joint activities. I put this up, the slide, this is the Berlin Declaration that was uh, initiated but by one of our member organizations, the Max Planck Society from Germany. Uh, and I put this up for three reasons, not that you read it because um, it's a long reading and, and many of you may, may know the content, but uh, reason number one is uh, that this is the operational definition that we have adopted for, uh, for Plan S. Now you may argue, is it the right definition? There are alternative de definitions, but if you, want to, uh, if you want to craft a policy and implement it, you have to opt for one operational definition and this is the one that we've chosen. Uh, we've not chosen it by chance because 
second comment that I would like to make. It's a very, uh, uh, in, in, as I see it, it, it it's a very well-crafted definition because it recognized that uh, open access is not just about free access, so it, about removing paywalls, but it is much more. It is about reusing uh, text. It is about uh, making it available to, to modern technology. Uh, so that was at that time already very uh, far-sighted uh, far -sighted to, to craft such a definition. And the third uh, reason why I put it up is the, uh, is the, um, the timestamp. This was crafted in 2003. That's 15 years ago. So 15 years ago, there was already this will and this drive by the scientific community because this was crafted by scientists, by researchers. It has been since uh, signed by over 700 universities, most of the major universities in Europe, research uh, organizations, funders, and, uh, and academies. Um, so in 2003, 15 years ago, there was already this strong drive from the uh, scientific community to, uh, to go for open access. Unfortunately, we have seen that the progress is, uh, has been extremely slow, and that's one of the reasons why, as funders, we, uh, we decided to, uh, uh, to, to step in and uh, to help that transition and to help the transition uh, happen uh, in, in a much swifter way than, uh, than has happened uh, up until now. Um, I don't have, uh, I think, to this audience uh, to recall what are the motivations or what are the, um, the benefits of, uh, of open access. But as founders, we are in a particular interesting situations. Of course, we want to serve the research community. We want to serve science. That's, that's our main mission. But we do so by investing money, and most of us do so by investing public money. So we have a particular duty of care also to the public, towards the taxpayer, on how we invest these funds. And one of the aspects here is very clearly that we have a mission to make sure that what is publicly funded, the research that is publicly funded, that these outcomes remain in the public domain. And the current paywall system is an obstacle to that. So that's what we, why we have recognized as funders that we have a duty of care both to the science system to make it work, but also to the, uh, uh, to the larger, to the wider public. Um, in, in this sense, I, I think it's worth recalling uh, the, the great theoretician of, uh, of the sociology of, uh, of science, Richard Merton, uh, uh, very clearly wrote in, you can read it, I, I can't read it from here, but he very clearly writes that uh, science being part of the public domain uh, has, a, has an obligation to communicate openly. And secrecy or hiding results is actually the antithesis of, uh, of the ethos of science. So open access or open science is not that new, as you can see. Uh, of course, with the digital revolution, with the technology that is in place, and that was clearly not in place in 19, 1942, things have tended to accelerate. But we should recall what it is science. Science is about making results openly available so that they can be tested by other scientists. Results that are kept secret or that are not make, be, being made available do not qualify as scientific. And we also need to make the science accessible to the wider public, to those that make use of it, to patients, to patient associations, to medical staff, doctors, and so on. Now, I come back to uh, the timestamp of 2003. This is data from the European Commission, uh, and you can see that the progress has been very slow. Um, Oh, I'm, I'm sure in other continents uh, that there are slight differences, but, but in any event, the rate of, uh, the rate of, of, of realization open access has not been, uh, has not been such as we, uh, we would expect it. In Europe in particular, the, uh, ministers, the, the, the ministers of science in 2016 uh, resolved that all research results funded uh, by, by European public uh, funders should become open access, access by 2020. Now you can see that we're very far from that. Uh, so that's the reason why we decided uh, as funders and uh, together with the European Commission that we, uh, that we just should step in, we ought to step in um, and design, design Plan S. Now, <clears throat> 
Plan S is a very simple principle, in, and we wanted to keep it simple in that sense, but that has a number of drawbacks, a number of advantages as well. We wanted to keep it simple. Uh, the statement is very clear. By 2020, we wish that publications uh, which reports on results that have been funded by national European funders, or at least those that have joined or that have signed up to Plan S, and by the European Commission uh, should become, uh, can only be published in compliant open access journals or compliant open access uh, uh, platforms. I shall tri pay tribute here to Robert Jan Smits, who was the former Director General uh, for Research and Innovation in the European Commission, and who uh, about a year ago took up, uh, uh, retired from that position, but then took up a, uh, the role of Special Envoy on Open Access for the European Commission. And it's really his drive, so he came to see us and said, we need to do something together. We need to have national funders on board as well. The European Commission alone cannot, uh, uh, cannot be the only driver for that change. And that's how we, uh, we designed and crafted Plan S to really make that transition, uh, to really accelerate that transition. Now, simple principles uh, are nice because they hold in one sentence or two. But of course, you need a little bit, you need to flash a little bit out. So that's why we added a further 10 points to this, uh, simple, to this simple principle to make it a little bit more clear of what it is that we wish to achieve. Uh, and here again, I will not go through this because even these 10 points were later, were in last November, were augmented by uh, implementation guidelines. Uh, which are a, even a little bit more detailed. Now, these implementation guidelines uh, are still under discussion because we had an open public consultation about Plan S. We got a large amount of input. We got more than 600 uh, contributions from organizations, universities, associations, and individuals. Uh, so we will go through all these, uh, through all these feedback uh, and then see what, um, uh, how we can amend the, uh, the implementation guidelines uh, in, in, the light of, uh, in the light of that feedback. But very, very simple, the, the, the basic principles are, uh, are about open access, so no longer should uh, research results funded by coalition as funders be, uh, uh, be held or locked behind paywalls. Um, open access should be immediate, so we do not welcome embargo periods because embargo periods do not uh, in any way serve the science system. Uh, that has no useful, uh, there is no use for embargo period for, for scientists. Um, publication should be under an open license, it's very important, and uh, an open license that embodies the spirit and the text of the Berlin Declaration. Um, we want transparency about prices, and, uh, and about contracts, because we, we recognize that one of, the, uh, one of the dysfunctionalities of the current system uh, are all these non-disclosure uh, clauses in, in, in a variety of contracts. Uh, and perhaps one of the most controversial statements is about the hybrid, about the hybrid model, which we do not uh, see as a, or we do not want to see the hybrid model to become uh, a well-established and, uh, uh, and definite model in the long run. We recognize that the hybrid model has its merits in a transition, as a transition model. So therefore, under, a number, under certain circumstances or attached with a number of conditions, we do accept the hybrid model, but we really want to see it as a transition model. And the transition model means that it has to have a clearly defined endpoint and a clearly defined uh, timeline, and the endpoint must be in a flipping towards open access. So what is different, uh, because plan, uh, what well, is different in Plan S because we have had many funder strategies or funder policies or even university policies. So in what sense uh, is, is Plan S different? Well, first of all, it, it is very much to the heart of what Science Europe is doing uh, in, in a number of cases is aligning our policies. So this is for the first time that funders have gathered to align their open access policies. Many of our funders had already open access policies before, but we had a patchwork of different open access policies. Some were for green, others were for gold. Uh, so we, we tried to stay out of that metal of the gold between green, gold against green. So this is more about strong principles than about the choosing one particular publication model. So it's alignment of funder policies, and this is what gives us, I think, or what, what has given us a certain impact because 
because I, I have seen that over the past months, uh, Plan S has had, at least in the discussions, uh, a, a considerable impact. Now, Plan S entails mandating open access. That's a strong move by funders. Uh, because, of course, we respect uh, uh, researchers, we, we, we wish researchers to give as much freedom as possible, but on the other hand, there is a balance to, make, to be made between the fair use of public money on one hand and the, uh, and the researchers' freedom on the other hand. So we mandate open access to, uh, uh, to those that, uh, that receive our grants. The third point is if we mandate something, we also have to cover the costs for it, and that's what we are committing as well. Uh, and there is a variety of costs that, uh, the ways that this can be done, either through the coverage or the payment of APC charges, or maybe through other means by, by helping journals to flip, or by in, in, in certain ways to, by, by, by engaging in or contributing to consortial model, so, which, which are known as diamond or platin. Plan S has a timeline, and this, is one of the, this was one of the deficiencies of previous open access policies from funders. We didn't have we didn't attach timelines to our policies. Science Europe already in 2013 published a statement on open access, or more than a statement, guidelines on open access, but we didn't put a timeline to that. So we didn't say, when do we expect this to happen? So this time we have not made that same mistake, and we clearly say we stick to the timeline that was, uh, uh, that was uh, uh, enunciated by the, uh, by the uh, Council of Ministers, 2020. Of course, this will only apply to calls or grants starting from 2020. So the first papers that come out of these grants will be, will be sometimes later. Um, and then Plan S is about principles, not about particular publication models. This is something that has been uh, misunderstood uh, by and large. Uh, it is not about the gold model uh, or APC-based model. Uh, it, it is about principles and the principles I, I have given you in, in the previous slide. And there is a variety of, uh, of publication models that can fit or that can accommodate the, uh, the principles of Plan S. And these are the chief librarians of, of Utrecht University, Bianca Kramer and, and Jörn Bosman. Uh, they have uh, lined out nine possible compliance routes uh, for, for Plan S, which range from gold, diamond to green, and which include, of course, the hybrid as a transitional temporary arrangement. So there is a variety of publication models that can be made compliant, uh, compliant with Plan S. Um, where do we stand? Well, we started uh, in less than five, uh, we published Plan S less than five months ago, and, and you've seen what, what kind of discussion, what kind of impact it has created. It's tremendous. So I think it has really, uh, it has really created a, uh, a, 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 a move towards, towards, towards a change in the publication system. Uh, we started with a core group of European funders uh, together with the European Commission, and since then a number of uh, European, European funders have joined as well. I think what is sig much more significant uh, is that we have had uh, the charity, charities like the Wellcome Trust and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation who have joined as well. These are very significant partners to Wellcome Trust, especially those from the UK know funds a very significant part of research uh, here. Uh, and the movement has, uh, has, uh, has now become a, a global movement. So at the Open Access Conference in, per in Berlin early December, there was a very strong statement from the Chinese delegation that they support both the OA2020 uh, and also Plan S. Uh, we have had in, in the past days the official statement from the uh, chief advisor of, uh, uh, to the Indian government that India will sign up to, uh, to Plan S. Um, we have African uh, funders like the uh, African Academy of uh, Sciences and also the first funder from the Middle East, Jordan, uh, who, who are now on board and uh, we're in discussion with a number of, of course, with many other funders. Um, I think it's important as well that there is an alignment. We will align uh, our policies with the OA 2020 policies because clearly we recognize the merits of transformative agreements uh, and that's part of the uh, part of the Plan S compliant route. So this is where we are. We started uh, Plan S also, I have to say, got considerable attention, not just within the community of scholar publishing or within the community of researchers, uh, but also much beyond. It made the headlines into a number of uh, 
of, of, of large newspapers. Um, and I have to say that the, um, the, I can now see that the public, the larger public, uh, is giving much more attention to what is happening. I've, in my country, I've been, uh, I, I spoke on the national radio uh, and, 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 and gave a, an introduction or, or presented the, 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 uh, the, the issue about open access in, in, in scholar publishing. Uh, and since then, I got a lot of feedback from people that are non-scientists. And, uh, and, and they are very, uh, they, they think this, this, they really think that the open access movement should be supported because they recognize that the public taxpayer money is being invested uh, into research and that should remain uh, open and in the public domain. Um, I'll stop it here. We had the, as I say, we had the public consultation. We got over 600, um, we got over 600 feedback uh, letters, which we will carefully evaluate and publish. And uh, we will then also publish how we will amend and change Plan S uh, in the light of this, uh, in the light of this feedback. And the final word is about the, uh, what was already mentioned uh, earlier. What we really have to engage now is also to revise the intense incentive and reward system of, uh, of science. And that's the next big project which uh, both in Science Europe but also with member, particular member organizations and with other organizations we will, uh, we will embark upon. So I'll stop here. Probably I over <laughs> did it already because uh, I, I, I think it's much more useful to have a, uh, to have a debate here and, uh, and I'm ready, ready to take your questions. Thank you. Thank you all. Okay. Okay, so I've, I've definitely got a few questions coming up for this, but I'm sure there are other people in the audience. Um, have the guy at the back? Oh, if you're actually go, go it's, um, to Mike, who's just there, yeah. And then at the back, and then here. Is it on? Yes, okay. Mark, we, we know each other, we've met before. Um, I thought you started off quite properly by reminding everybody about the Berlin Declaration in 2003. So I'm rather curious as to why there are no German funders signed up to Plan S. I, I'll answer immediately or do we? Please, yes. yes. Okay. So the, <clears throat> the situation in Germany is a little bit particular because they have an extremely broad interpretation of, uh, of, uh, of academic freedom, which is enshrined in their constitution. There is actually a, cons a court case uh, against an open access, not Plan S, but against an, an, an open access mandate from, uh, from a university, the University of Co Constance, that has made it up to the Constitutional Court. It's, uh, as, I, as I'm informed, it's still pending. Uh, so they are a little bit uh, cautious with the mandate. I think this is an interesting point because you may ask why are not more funders on board, especially European funders. Well, many European funders are actually almost aligned with Plan S, but they differ maybe on one or two points. Germany, for instance, is fully aligned with Plan S, but they are hesitant or they do, do not want to make it a strict mandate. But otherwise, they are fully in line with Plan S. Germany, for instance, has never paid APCs. The German Research Foundation, they have never paid APCs for hybrid journals. They, they immediately recognize that this is not the way to go. So on many points, they are aligned with Plan S. The same situation is for Switzerland. Switzerland is, is the Swiss National Science Foundation is, is in, on, on the principles, is fully aligned with Plan S. It is just that the time scale or the timeline, they want to give themselves a little bit more time. Uh, for, for the Swedish uh, Research Council, it is similar. So it is not as if those that are not on the list that they would be completely in disagreement or completely off with the uh, with Plan S. On the contrary, but they may have uh, they may differ on one or two of the uh, of the aspects, and that's the case for Germany. Thank you. Um, we had a question at the back. Yeah, um, this is um, Robert Harrington. I, I'll stand up so you can see my big, big white hair. Um, so this is Robert Harrington from the American Mathematical Society. As a, and I have a specific question actually about mirror journals, though generally we applaud the sort of conversation about openness. Uh, we do worry about our future as a society to be sustainable and do the things that we do for our rather large community of 30,000 members. 
Back in 2014, we launched a mirror journal, which essentially was our approach to avoid doing hybrid um, and launch a completely new open access pure gold journal that shared an editorial board with uh, another journal that we had um, called Transactions of the American Mathematical Society. So I worry about Plan S, and not the principle so much, but the implementation. The devil is always in the details. And for some reason, it appears that mirror journals are classed as hybrid, except that they're not, um, because really all that's being shared is an editorial board. And I just wondered if you had any comments on that, because it, it worries me when I see something that doesn't sort of add up logically. Well, I would have much to say about, about hybrid journals. And uh, so one of, the, one of the issues with hybrid journals, of course, is that a hybrid journal isn't really an open access journal because a hybrid journal to the reader appears as a random collection or a, a bizarre collection where some papers are randomly made open access and others are not. Uh, so that, that strikes me as not being really open access and any sensible reader uh, will have to, to pay the subscription to get access to the whole range I of just, papers. I just want to clarify that yeah. what I was saying was that I understand what you're saying about hybrid, but I was trying to ask about directly why are um, these, so what's been called a mirror journal, which is a pure gold open access journal, why are they yeah. being classed as I was coming hybrid? to that. Okay, because sorry. In, in, in a sense, so in a hybrid journal, you, you have a collection of uh, random open access papers, at least random to the reader, uh, and, and, and the others are, are, are paywalled. Now, you can rearrange this collection uh, so that the first half is uh, out the random open access paper and then split it out, and that becomes a mirror journal. Uh, nevertheless, you're still, running, you're still running a single journal. You're still running a single journal which has the same purpose, which has the same addresses, the same audience, uh, and, and, and any sensible reader will have to pay the, uh, uh, will have to access both. Actually, that's not true at all in the case of uh, the mirror journal we launched in 2014 well before this discussion and it's a pure gold journal it doesn't have an impact factor yet actually because we are, we're applying for that um, it's it's not in any way tied to a subscription model the only way it's tied to what's been done already is through an editorial board decision it doesn't prop up subscription model and it, it your response sort of says to me that you're not quite understanding what these journals represent. But I, I understand what you're saying, and I don't want to make, take away from other people's chance to ask questions. So thank yeah, you. So, uh, thank you very much for that question. I think it, it feels as though, I mean, Mark, Mark is going to be here for much of the day, so I think there'll also be opportunities to, to take some of these discussions that are in more detail, of, of, you know, offline. Um, I think the next question was at the, the front here, and then it was the lady in the middle. Um, Anthony Watkins and Cyber Research. Um, I want to make two points related. One is, why did you not consult with the learned societies before um, bringing out Plan S? Because after all, they represent the scientific body. You yourself, I see as a researcher, you have the International Union of Crystallography. This is my second question. All their journals, bar two, are hybrid. Are they going to become compliant? As somebody active in that organization, presumably you know. Well, I think we have been talking, we are in discussions with, uh, with the learned societies, at least with many learned societies. We have been, we have been even before, we have been in discussion with the, uh, and, and it's, uh, I've been in discussion with many publishers. Of course, there are 3,000 publishers around the world. Um, so in, 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 in that sense, and the hybrid journal, as the hybrid model, as I've said, is, is a model which we, which we accept, but we want to see it as what it has been really designed for, as a transition model, a model to help the transition from the subscription to the full open access in a smooth and non-disruptive way. Alas, this hasn't really happened. Very few journals have flipped from hybrid to full open access. And we have now seen, we now see from statistics that the latest, there is data published by uh, uh, universities UK, which show that uh, 
that now between 2012 and 2016, the percentage worldwide of hybrid journal uh, has overtaken uh, the proportion of, of pure subscription journals. So what we fear is that the hybrid model becomes the dominant model. Of course, it is a very, for publishers, it is a model which, which takes most of the risks out, uh, the risks, the business risks that are associated with the transition to open access. Uh, so it shuffles that risk off to the scholar community. Uh, but we want to see the end point of it. We want to see this, the transition completed at some point. Because otherwise we, we feel that we are being stuck with it uh, for the next uh, 20 or 30 years. And the problem is that the uh, hybrid journal is also, we feel, is, is, is also, hybrid journals are also now becoming barriers to entry for new and innovative open access publishing uh, models. Why should, a, why should an, a publisher go for the more risky road of, uh, of, uh, of offering a full open access outlet uh, when there is the less riskier road and safer road of, of hybrid journals where you continue to benefit, where a publisher continues to benefit from a secure cushion of, uh, uh, of subscription on income and on top has some extra income from, uh, uh, from for, for, through APCs, uh, from those founders and scientists uh, that care about open access. So yes, so the hybrid is, is a model that we support, but only as a transition model. When it comes to the learned society, let me say that as well. We care for, for the learned societies. We, we think they have a very important role to play, and we are in discussions with many of them. Now, we have to recognize there is a variety of learned societies. There are some very large ones which run their publishing part almost as a commercial publishers and generate large surpluses. Uh, there are small and medium-sized uh, learned societies. There are learned societies that, that, that have actually outsourced part of their publishing business to a commercial publishers. So there is a large variety in there. And we recognize that. And especially we, are, we, we do not want the small and medium-sized learned society to, uh, uh, to, to be the collateral damage. Of, of Plan S, so that's why uh, UKRI, the Wellcome Trust, uh, together with the Association of uh, Learned and Professional Societies, uh, uh, are sitting on a table. We have, we have, uh, uh, we have commissioned uh, a, a study to help or to design models to help those learned societies, especially the small and, and medium-sized ones, to, uh, to achieve the transition. So we are in, in very, very much in discussion and, uh, with, with the learned societies, and we think they have an important role to play. But on the other hand, as I said earlier, we have a, that we have, as funders, we have to strike a balance between the fair use of public money on one hand, uh, and of course the, the, the freedom to, uh, uh, to publish on the other, on the other hand. And um, learned societies, they do, some learned societies generate surpluses from their publication business or their publication activities, let's call it that way, uh, and, and they use these surpluses to do other useful and laudable activities. Uh, but one has to ask the questions, do library budgets, which in many places are very thinly spread, do we have to use library budgets to cross-subsidize these activities? So I say to a certain extent, yes, because of course it's beneficial for the research community, but there has to be a fair balance here as well. So I think learned societies should reflect on their way to, on, on how, how they, they should fund themselves, especially for these, uh, for these other activities, which we all agree are laudable. Uh, but it's just where does, where should the money, where should the financial flows come from? Thank you, Mark. Um, I think it was Katrina next, and then a gentleman on the same table. And then I can see someone in the back. Yeah. Katrina McCallum from Hindawi. Um, I um, was going to ask two questions, actually, but you, you asked my, answered my second one, because I think there's a huge role for societies here, but we have to split funding for the good works they do from um, access to science. Um, both are good, but subsidising one does not um, provide justification for denying the other. Um, but the main point uh, I wanted to bring up <clears throat> was about the research evaluation system. So I was very pleased to see you mentioned DORA um, in your talk, and I'm on the steering committee of the relaunched DORA. 
And that to me seems the most vital component if Plan S is to work, um, that there is also a similarly aggressive roadmap for cultural change that, um, and, and this is where funders and societies can work to uh, redefine what quality means in, in a digital networked age. Um, and is there any intention for Plan S? I know you've got a commitment to change that, but can you actually put a timeline, start to put a timeline on these changes whereby the funders <coughs> will make changes to their own grant reward systems? Yes, I'm, I'm very glad that you, that you mentioned that because as I, as I say, this is at the key, this is really at the center of the change that we want to, uh, that we want to trigger. Uh, now, many of the funders in coalition has, have already subscribed to DORA are, and, and have done concrete action. I can say from my own funding, uh, funding agency, I, 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 I did not want to sign up to DORA before we had implemented concrete action to do so. So in, in, in my funding agency, we, we now very clearly instruct reviewers uh, not to look for journal impact factors and these kind of metrics, but that they should assess the, uh, the, the research on, 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 its, on, on its own merits uh, that they should assess researchers on their own merits. Uh, we also instruct researchers when they submit their grant applications not to list journal impact factors. Uh, we actually limit them. We say just send us, give us a list of the most important papers and we ask them what is it, why is it so, what, why was this paper so important? So it's not just enough to say well it was published in journal X or in journal with impact factor uh, Y. Um, this is something which I have to say there are, again, as was the case for Plan S, there are a number of countries and funding agencies which are at the very forefront here. Uh, and I mentioned the, the, the Netherlands, so you've, you may have seen that the Netherlands really, not just the funders, but also the, the, the Dutch University Association and the Academy, they have joined and they have made this the, 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 the big topic for, for next year. So there will really be a concrete action plan uh, designed by, the, uh, by all these Dutch stakeholders to change the reward and incentive system, which, which is quite remarkable because the Netherlands was used to be one of the places where the reliance on metrics and on impact factors and measures, all this was very strongly pronounced. So it's quite remarkable that this is the country which is taking uh, such a leading role now. Uh, we are working together with the European University Association where there is clear uh, recognition that uh, also within the universities things have to change. So I don't know what the timeline will be. I think this will be a never-ending process because as you, as you correctly mentioned, this is about changing the culture. And that takes time. Uh, but I think there is, I've never seen in, 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 the, in the seven years that I've been, uh, in, 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 that I've moved to, to the business of funding, I've never seen such a clear determination from both funders and other stakeholders in academia uh, to change the reward system. Hey, did you want to just um, yes. very quickly? Uh, thanks very much. Um, the, the danger without a timeline is that change will happen, but decades down the line, and what we'll do is entrench the existing oligopoly without the innovation that we need, and it could actually delay things further um, without without that aggressive timeline, even though Plan S aims to be such a catalyst for change, I think I think they could be. Well, I, I I think we we have now uh, at least those funders that are in coalition S are very dedicated and and have made a what some have called a radical or bold plan. I don't think it's that radical. It's just it 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 wants to we we want to change the system from within. But nevertheless, uh, if if should we notice that that other project, the project of changing the reward system and the incentive culture in academia, that that should not make the desired progress, uh, well, we may need a plan S, uh, a bold plan S equivalent for, uh, for that other project. Yes, my name's John Dove, and I want to think about the reader in this case in terms of hybrid. And you brought up the fact that if the hybrid is a hodgepodge, it's not quite the same experience. There's something really basic about hybrid articles, and that is if I go back 15 years ago, there was a time when libraries were greatly concerned about the fact that researchers were buying stuff that the library already owned. 
And so a whole set of machinery put, was put in place, the open URL standard and link resolvers. And how many of you as researchers discover an article because you find it cited somewhere? And next to that citation was an open URL link which would say, here's the best way you can get to that article. That whole machinery does not work with hybrid articles. It's architected at the journal level, and so you will only get to that open article if, in fact, your institution subscribes to that journal. So it's a fundamental false promise. So if there is a, if there is a time frame on which hybrid articles should be the transitioned out, it should be sooner rather than later. Well, thank you. In my long list of arguments against hybrids, this is yet another, uh, another item on, uh, on the list. Thank you. All right, I think um, we're, we're running out of time, unfortunately. I, mean, I know that there are still some questions um, people wanting to, to speak come through, but um, hopefully you'll we'll be able to catch Mark um, before, the, before um, he has to leave. Um, so can I say thank you very much, Mark, thank for, you. for coming. Thank you. Yeah, and I'm sure it's not the last time that we'll be, we'll be discussing Plan S and, and open access. In fact, for some of us, it's going to be very soon. Um, in fact, here's my colleague, Laura Cox, who's another advisory board member, who's just going to give you a, a rundown.